Um, thanks for joining us for the uh, Turing's Fellows intro talk. Um, so I'm Magnus Stratra, I'm director of our Institute for Data Science and AI. Um, and these talks are to introduce our new uh, Turing Fellows who've uh, just been Turing Fellows since uh, October, I think. Uh, many new faces. So we're having these talks to find out what the Turing Fellows are doing and uh, to learn about the diverse interests across our um, sort of uh, fellow intake. And uh, Marcel van Herk is our first speaker today. So he's a chair of radiotherapy and he's going to talk about radiotherapy precision treatment for cancer patients. So over to Marcel. Thank you, uh, Magnus. Let me share my screen. There we go. And yeah, this is maybe a little bit, uh, uh, you can see my screen, I assume. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you, man. A little different talk because I'm a, I'm a, general, a very generic uh, researcher in one very typical field of, of, uh, of medicine called radiotherapy. And I'm very much uh, a developer of methodology in that field, but a user of AI. So let's start with explaining what uh, radiotherapy is. So if you have a tumor in your body, then, then obviously the first thing you want to do is cut it out, but often that's not possible. And then external beam radiotherapy is used a lot. It's actually used in about half of the cancer patients. So what you do is you scan your patient on a CT scanner, you uh, delineate uh, the target. Here is a prostate uh, on a computer that's done by a physician. And then a uh, radiographer uh, set up the patient on a treatment machine and try to point the beams at an invisible tumor because that's inside the body with invisible beams. And that has to be done on many, many, many fractions. So that's the classical radiotherapy procedure. But before you can do the radiotherapy, you have to do treatment planning. So you have to figure out where the cancer is and how you can best get there with the beams and which organs need to be avoided because you can imagine that if you shoot your beams through a, a sensitive organ, you can create a lot of damage. So you want to avoid that as much as possible. This is an optimization problem with thousands of parameters. And we use a combination of optimization algorithms, manual tweaking and clinical knowledge um, to uh, optimize this problem. And clinical knowledge is what I'll be talking about a lot. So what is the ultimate aim of radiotherapy? Well, first it is to eradicate all tumor cells. And you can do this by increasing the tumor dose, using larger margins, basically treat more of the patient. Uh, but eventually you want to increase the geometrical position such that you can limit damage to the normal tissues. So which is where you want to reduce the organobus dose, you want to use smaller safer margins, but again with increased geometrical position. But in terms of knowledge, you need to define your target accurately and your normal tissues accurately, and you need to understand the dose effect relationship. And I've been working in radiotherapy all my life, and I started very much on the technology side. So, so this is my very, very ancient technological work where I started building detectors to visualize the patient with the treatment beam. And uh, this image from 1986 shows you a head and neck cancer patient with the treatment fields imaged with this particular detector that I developed. And the software that I developed uh, was kind of done and commercialized in 1992. And this picture shows that the same software was used almost 25 years later. It tells you something about longevity of medical software, but, I, but I've done lots of things. Another thing that I've worked on is Combim CT image guided radiotherapy. And uh, basically, mod all modern treatment machines have a built in X ray tube and flat panel imager. And if you rotate around the patient, you can make a 3D or 4D representation of the patient. And uh, this picture shows you a movie loop of a patient imaged twice with about with a, a couple of days apart uh, on different fractions. And you can see that the tumor is moving up and down due to breathing here in this, uh, for instance, in this sagittal view. But there is also a shift of the tumor due to a baseline shift, which, uh, which is not related to breathing. And, uh, and uh, this software was developed by myself and my group commercialized and has been used to treat millions of patients. 
So the latest is MR-guided radiotherapy, where the treatment machine is integrated with an MR scanner. And uh, what is not, on, not only different about this machine is the imaging. You've got better imaging because MR gets a better soft tissue contrast. But all the steps that are normally taken offline, such as treatment planning, have been moved onto the treatment machine. And that means that this is a very resource intensive uh, treatment where you see lots of people standing around the console uh, and taking about 30 minutes for a simple case and about an hour for a, for a complicated case. So, so definitely something has to be done here to make this more efficient. So, but before you can do all this technical radiotherapy, you have to figure out where the target is. And uh, we, for quite a long time, we knew that this is a weak link. So if you ask a doctor to delineate, he or she will do that very carefully, looking at all the slices, editing, and level a window, changing contours, moving up and down. And we created a study software called Big Brother that records all these interactions. And that allows us to study interaction patterns, such as in this publication by Asama et al, where she showed that particular users were particular, using particular slicing patterns to visualize the anatomy in 3D around the slice that they were at. But, but using the software, we found out that Target contouring is really, really a weak link. If you give the doctor a very unclear image without any PET scan, then basically there are centimeters big differences in target definition. And even with better imaging, including a PET scan, a little light bulb that shows you where the tumor is, you still have about a centimeter difference in, uh, in contouring. And in the very, very best, best situation, it's about five millimeters. So we need to improve this. So how can we improve target definition? Well, technically we could do it by training. I've been teaching for a very long time. Um, uh, we can de develop better protocols, taking the clinical and physical uh, properties of the imaging into account. We can develop computer assistance, and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, we can work on full automation and we can generate knowledge about the contouring. But uh, the, the image on the right shows you an example of computer assistance. And this is a novel tool that we're, uh, that we're trialing out together with a company called Mirada. And we have a workshop coming up uh, in a couple of weeks time where we're testing out this tool. And if you're drawing a contour, and this is a very, very poorly drawn contour of a rest target volume, it shows with little symbols what you're doing wrong whether you're too high, too left, too much left, too much right, or using the incorrect uh, level of window presets such that you can't see the underlying anatomy. And what we are now trying out is how acceptable this kind of feedback is and how it changes um, the human behavior. But there is a very other aspect of, of knowledge and that's, that's when does the tumor actually go away, yes or no? And um, to understand why that is, we've been looking at big data analysis. And um, we started out uh, in prostate cancer because there was a bit, a little bit of a mystery there. Um, and it turned out that the recurrence of prostate cancer was related to the anatomy of the rectum. If there was a very, very full rectum, the tumor came back more often. And uh, we couldn't really work it out. So we started to look at a relationship between the delivered dose distributions of different patients. So this is a movie loop showing all the dose distributions of different patients mapped onto a template patients. And we related these dose distributions uh, to control or failure at a certain time point. And we did that by just averaging the dose distributions of all the controls and all the failures. And to our uh, pleasure, we actually found that there was, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, a difference, and this was difference was located around three centimeter away from the prostate, and it turned out the patients that had a higher dose in this so-called obturator region had a better uh, control of their prostate cancer. Basically, showing you that the uh, the that the definition of the target volume was incorrect, and I think this is the first time that big data analysis uh, gave us that opportunity. Uh, but. But microscopic disease spread might not always be there. So it's, it's, it's uh, very much of interest to develop biomarkers of uh, microscopic disease. And Angie Davy in our group has been working on distance failure modeling, modeling of, of lung cancer patients, which are treated with very, very narrow beams, uh, very, very focused. 
And it turns out that 90% of these patients have their tumor controlled, but between 13 and 30% uh, and of patients, the tumor comes back either close to the, to the original small nodule or far away. And that basically means that the tumor has already spread before you start treatment. Now, if we can model that spread, if we can predict which patients have that spread, we can uh, change our treatment, for instance, by giving systemic treatment or by, uh, for instance, increasing the field size of our radiotherapy. And she created a model based on uh, a Cox inter interaction model where she looked at dose and, and pixel values in radial shells around the tumor. And she showed that if you combine the mean density of the tumor at the border with the dose uh, around the tumor at about three centimeter distance, she could predict which patients were gonna have a distant failure. And uh, now we're obviously uh, validating this work with, together with New York, and potentially this would give us the opportunity to develop a clinical trial where for a subset of patients we change the dose delivery and hopefully improve their outcome. Now, a completely different aspect uh, is toxicity. And the whole data mining approach that we used can be used for that as well. Again, we looked at dose distributions of different patients, mapped them all onto a template patients and determined uh, which location, in which location the dose distribution was most uh, related to survival. And that turned out to be in the apex of the heart, in the top of the heart, uh, sorry, the base of the heart, in the top of the heart. And, uh, and this is a, a very, very important finding. And we have now about 12 publications validating this in, in different uh, cohorts and looking at different methodologies to, um, to describe this effect. And it, and it comes back in pretty much all our publications. So, so, so these are kind of big data steps, but now what can we do with AI in radiotherapy? Well, we can use it to make things faster because AI is, is really good in reproducing uh, a very complex algorithms, but being trained by, with hundreds of input data and then replicating the output with high accuracy. But we also, also want to make, it, make things better. And basically we need to train our AI with expert data because otherwise we'll have the problem of garbage into the AI and garbage out. And it's a black box. So, so it's difficult to tell um, how that come about. And the last thing that we can do is we can make things possible, such as biomarker development and big data analysis. And I'll have some examples of that. So first of all, we need to have lots of data. And Garrett Price is now a senior lecturer in her group, has developed the UKCAT trusted research environment. That basically means that um, all the data that is in the Christie clinical network is anonymized and replicated in a secure environment which then can be accessed through a firewall and where we can do uh, data analysis. And the ethics for this is, is, is arranged in an umbrella structure. So basically we can get approval to do a data analysis on existing clinical data uh, in, in, time, in a matter of weeks. We also are currently trying to link this up with the uh, Greater Manchester Care Record. And we've got that working for uh, COVID related research. We don't have it working yet for non-COVID related research because the governance is quite complicated. Then um, uh, if you have these data sources, obviously you want to go national. And so we're looking at setting up uh, data sharing infrastructures uh, together with other RedNet centers. And an example of a data sharing is COVID RT lung where we're looking at uh, the treatments of uh, COVID patients and looking at their change in management and clinical outcomes uh, during the epidemic. And then globally, we're looking into distributed learning uh, to connect different data sources together. And for instance, we have uh, shown um, uh, a 20,000 patient demonstration of distributed model building, um, uh, and that was published last year. So if you have all this data, you can, for instance, start uh, working on contouring. And uh, this is, uh, this is an, a task that is, uh, that is relatively easily automated. And so already several years ago, there were many publications about uh, this kind of use of AI, where uh, the uh, AI uh, here in, uh, in green is trying to replicate the contours by 
uh, uh, by the physicians in red. There is a problem there, you know, the, because once we start introducing AI, maybe the knowledge how to delineate targets is reducing, and that would have a very, very severe impact. So we actually want to train our networks with very limited data. And one of the projects that we have running is by Ed Henderson et al. And he has been looking at training and validating uh, uh, networks for segmentation in head and neck in the context of observer variation. And he trained network with a small amount of high quality data in green. And then he uh, trained the same network with a large quantity of, um, of uh, less well uh, moderated data. Uh, in this case, the quality data was only 30 cases. The quantity data was hundreds of cases. And you can see that that training with the, with the quality data in green came closer to the average of five observers than training with the poor quality data. So in this case, quality is better than quantity. Another thing that you can do with AI is generate new image modalities. And we have an issue that specifically on the MR LINAC, we want, when we want to image the patient with many, many different sequences, this is incredibly time consuming. So what we have been looking into is, is from uh, one MR sequence, generating another MR sequence using a cycle GAN. And uh, this is an example where you can see the, uh, the actual image on the left and the generated image on the right, and that those are uh, of, of high quality. Now, uh, I, I explained a little bit about big data analysis, but can you use AI in big data analysis as well? Well, this is a publication from two of our MFIS students who came out uh, this year. And uh, they, what they did is they used an AI to generate standard contours, standardized contours of the target volume, in this case, the prostate, and then compared that with human observers. And this is, this is exaggerated. They're not that bad. But, uh, but basically what, what they looked at is uh, here in a radial map, what happens to the clinical outcome when the contour is bigger or smaller in a particular area around uh, the, uh, the target. And what they showed is that if you increase the, the delineation around the bladder and the seminal vesicles, you get a better outcome. And correlated to that are, uh, are, uh, are uh, uh, de decrease of the targets in, in other directions. And AI can also make new things possible, such as biomarkers. Uh, a very good biomarker is, is for sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is muscle wastage, and that basically affects, is, is an indication of your global health. And if you're not healthy, you don't have a lot of energy, you can't deal with cancer treatment very well. So we needed uh, auto-segmentation of muscle compartments in uh, CT scans, and Donald McSweeney is working on that. And what he's been showing is that if you use optimized uh, transfer learning, you can train your networks with about 25 cases and get a better performance than the human observers uh, for, uh, for contouring these targets. And Andrew Green has shown that the outcome in, in different cohorts uh, is in survival is clearly related to the amount of sarcopenia that you measure in this way. So this is a biomarker of uh, global health. And we think that this could be um, uh, complementary or maybe even replace in the future things like performance status, which are qualitative markers of health. Now then we also have biomarkers of other comorbidities. And Azadeh Abravan is working on, uh, on cardiac outcomes and she has been using uh, automatically segmented calcifications in 40 CT data, the little red contours, to determine the, the load of calcifications in a patient. And we showed that patients with a lot of calcifications have poor survival than patients with, with less calcifications. And if you use that, com that, that marker of comorbidity and or, and or uh, uh, data from hospital episode statistics, you can look at the incidence of cardiac disease after radiotherapy um, uh, as function of time. And uh, interestingly, it showed that patients that had cardiac disease before radiotherapy were actually less sensitive uh, than patients that did not have cardiac disease 
And um, so there are very, very complex interactions which may be related to medications that the patients are on. on and that is that's obviously very interesting to investigate. Now, the last example that I want to show is going towards causal inference to learn dose effect relationship. And this starts with an observation that uh, Johns, Corin, Johnson, Hart did uh, using data in our center. So if you have a treatment plan of a patient with a tumor close to the heart, then uh, obviously we try to spare the heart when, when treatment planning. But when we set up these patients, there are always small residual errors in how the patient is set up. And what she did is she, she correlated those small residual errors first with clinical variables to show that they were truly random. So the, these random shifts of maybe plus or minus a millimeter or two are totally random. And those shifts, they affect the dose to the heart. If the shift is towards the heart, then there will be more dose given to the heart. And it turned out that if you factorize the shifts, indeed in the shifts towards and away from the heart, you find a significant difference in overall survival. And, uh, and this actually is, 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 uh, is an instrumental variable method because we have a small modification of the dose that is not related to any confounders. And we showed in a cohort here of about a thousand patients that we could relate that to survival. So now we are looking into uh, creating an instrumental variable method uh, for that that is more uh, formal. So, so far what we've done is we've split uh, the heart shift data in different populations which are based on the planned dose to the heart. And that allows us to see whether the dose increase uh, has an impact for very low dose patients, for intermediate dose patients, for high dose patients. And we showed that for intermediate dose patients, there was a significant impact of the shifts on survival. So this gives us an inkling of what the dose is that we should avoid giving to these patients. Um, but we definitely need new methodology. And we're thinking of developing a, a, uh, a hybrid of Cox modeling and causal inference, but we haven't get, gotten very far with that yet. So that brings me to my conclusions. Radiotherapy is a great field for machine learning. Uh, AI can accelerate many tests, tasks, but we need good training data, garbage in, garbage out. And given the high technical accuracy, we're going to focus now on knowledge research, such as imaging biomarkers, improving clinical performance, and uh, developing novel methods for establishing dose effect relationships. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Thanks, Marcel. Um, great talk. Um, uh, if people have questions, they can put them in the chat, or I think there's not such a huge number that you can probably just unmute and talk. Um, I'll start while people are thinking. Uh, so Marcel, um, how transferable are models across different centers? So I'm wondering how big, a, is, is there a problem in radiotherapy with kind of, um, differences in instruments or setups across different centers. Are, mod are machine learning models easily transferable or is that challenging? Uh, well, obviously I think patient's anatomy is pretty much the same, although uh, maybe in Americas, uh, the patients are a little bit uh, bigger than, uh, than, than, than in maybe in other countries. Uh, so, so those kind of geometrical models are quite well transferable. It turns out that uh, models of dose effect relationships are quite poorly transferable. And there are several reasons for that. I think the first one is that the patient populations are often quite different. So the amount of comorbidities are different in different hospitals. Uh, uh, and in Manchester, they're actually quite bad. The other thing is that these models often are just plain wrong because they're based on confounding uh, rather than on the actual biological effect. And that's why we're interested in developing these causal inference uh, methods. And, uh, and finally, the, the equipment is similar, but it turns out that uh, the way that the equipment is used is actually quite different. And so, so, so that could be another reason uh, why the models are not transferable. But, but obviously, if you got the biology, biology right, they should be fairly transferable. But, but I, getting the right is difficult. Also, at the beginning, you sort of said you were um, an expert in radiotherapy methodology, but a user of AI. And I was wondering if you think that you're now at the stage where you're may maybe generating 
new AI questions? Because I guess AI is kind of driven by the questions pe people are trying to address. Is that you mentioned at the end this causality Cox thing? Is that maybe an example where you're pushing more into the AI methodology then? Oh, def definitely, yeah. The, and and uh, and I am also very very proud of what my my students are achieving in terms of of training, just just like segmentation models, you know, because the, there is there's an enormous amount of work to be done. Uh, but, but for us, it always starts with the question. Yeah, we are not methodology people, but obviously when the question asks for methodology, we will develop it. And then, and, it's, and, it's, and then of course, the interesting thing is whether that methodology can be applied back to other fields. Yeah. Which is... So Ravi is asking, uh, are the models explainable? So um, I guess explainability is linked to causality. They're not exactly the same, but um, you know, have, have you, when you do these kind of machine learning models, often they're quite hard to interpret. Yes. So, uh, and 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 that is that is that is a difficulty, and so and there is no, no simple answer to that. So basically, what we want to do is we want to test our model in other cohorts, which uh, which gives us a little bit of, of evidence. We want we are starting to test our models in small animals such that we can see whether the model is act, indeed describing a biological effect which we can otherwise not measure. Or we want to try and measure the biological effect by uh, adding imaging. For instance, if we think the heart is damaged, we measure heart function and see if it changes. Uh, but, but yeah, the, but it, it, I think the ultimate proof of such a model is a clinical trial where you base yourself on the model, but you need to have a lot of cumulative evidence before you can convince people to start such a clinical trial. I was going to say, you are in a position where you can actually do the ultimate uh, proof through, through trials once you get good evidence. Um, yeah, yeah, but it's a very long process. <laughs> and and uh, So there's and, another question here, I yeah. think also from Ravi. So what do you think is going to accelerate the AI and imaging applications even further? It's come a long way, but what's next in store? I mean, and limited by what? And one thing I was thinking is, you know, you mentioned labeling and the, the it's very expensive, this business of labeling. Is that an area, do you think, where there's going to be a lot of breakthroughs where, where maybe we can deal with a lot less expert labeling? Well, uh, that's, that's, that's ongoing. Um, I think a, a, a main problem is that uh, whatever, whatever we do in terms of automatic labeling, the doctors always disagree. Um, and so that, that is incredibly time consuming. So actually it's, it's more of a, an educational thing where you want to explain that whatever the computer does has uncertainty, but whatever a human does has uncertainty too. And if those two are in the same range, you should probably not touch it because you're going to make it worse. Um, and uh, so, so I think that is the limiting factor. And the problem that, that the observers are touching these labelings uh, basically means that they spend almost as much time doing it automated than doing it manual. And, and that really limits the uptake. Mm. So, so it's, it's, it's on a completely different aspect than the technology. It's the interpretation that needs to be improved. Do you do so? I've seen in some applications that um, the machine learning is kind of used to prioritize uh, scans that go to humans, which are challenging. You know, sort of uh, take the difficult ones. Do you do anything like that? So no, because 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 radiotherapy is very much individualized. So a lot of time is spent on all the data of of one patient. Um, so before you know that this data is challenging. Uh, yeah, well, you, you'll see that, you know, the, so, so that, that is not really relevant. It's maybe different in terms of screening or such, though, yeah, diagnostic task, yeah, but yeah. it's very much a localization task that needs to be done for everybody. Yeah, I think it was probably screening I was thinking of. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Marcel. Great talk, thanks. Um, I think we can move on to our uh, next speaker. Um, so uh, next up uh, is David Wong. So David actually is joint in the Center for Health Informatics in the School of Health and in the Department of Computer Science. So he's, he's got a joint appointment. Um, and David's going to talk about um, towards remote and contactless assessment of movement disorders. So David, go ahead and share your screen when you're ready.
Well, there you go. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Magnus, give us some noise yeah, if you can. That's good, good. yeah. Cool. yeah. Um, so really um, good question from, from you, Magnus, to, to Marcel. And it's something that I'll pick up on as we start off uh, in just a moment. Um, but um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to speak. And it's obviously, it's always a pleasure to, to share a, a virtual platform with Professor Van Herk. So we've virtually uh, and, and in person recently started working together. Um, so despite um, our quite big differences, as you, you'll see in our kind of core areas of research. Um, so my work focuses on using continuous data, health data, to solve real clinical problems. So very much like Marcel, I'm interested in the problem first and AI second. Um, and so some examples of that over the last year or two are on the next couple of slides, and then I'll focus on, on one particular clinical theme. And so the first here on the slide is a graph of some unpublished work from a pilot study at the Christie Hospital, led by John Radford and Annie Tyvey. And in this pilot, patients who had stabilised with COVID were asked to wear sticky patches. So these are adhesive patches on your chest that um, measure um, vital signs. So they contain vital sign sensors to measure heart rate, breathing rate, um, temperature and oxygen saturation. And then they were sent home um, as per usual care, but with these sensors attached. And so the sensor wasn't used to intervene in any way, it was um, totally observational. But from our small sample, a few were readmitted to hospital. And um, on the slide here is an anonymized trace from one such patient. And I'll talk you through it because the writing is quite small. So for COVID, you might have heard that the most common sign that things are not going well is a drop in oxygen saturation. So this is the fourth rectangle down and you can see here it was up near 100 percent and then drops down towards 90 percent and indeed this patient is someone who um, was readmitted to hospital but what's quite interesting here is that we also see there's a gradual increase in heart rate on the top and the second in breathing rates um, over three days prior to their readmission. So, so far we haven't done anything more than a, this kind of descriptive analysis at the moment, but our next step is to determine whether these sorts of trends are consistent enough to be used as an early warning score to detect when patients may need additional medical attention. And indeed this sort of work has been done previously for in-hospital patients. So the overall aim of this then would be to make discharge from hospital safer in that patients could continue to be monitored in a so-called virtual ward at home. And this is quite embryonic work, so my hunch really is that the bottleneck won't end up to being to do with data, but rather user experience and system problems. So user experience because those vital sign patches are really, a, really very uncomfortable to wear, and system problems because it's, its use fundamentally changes how hospitals undertake healthcare. So for instance, do we need extra staff to monitor any system? The second example is some work in which we've been trying to tackle the, the somewhat classic task of identifying cardiac abnormalities from 12 lead ECG signals. So ECGs are your heart traces, you put a bunch of stickers on your heart and you get to that kind of classic casualty signal. That's been an ongoing piece of work driven by the release of a really big data set and released by the MIT PhysioNet team in the last year and their con corresponding PhysioNet challenge. So we've been trying to classify um, 25 common conditions by training various neural networks. And of course, we're not the only ones to do this, um, but our, our most recent approach is going beyond kind of just throwing the, the latest and greatest convolutional neural network architecture of a problem by really trying to address the issue of generalization. And um, it was really inspired by some work by an old um, undergraduate student of mine who's been looking at this approach for um, brain MRI segmentation, where they found there are real differences in images in the UK biobank between hospitals to the extent that it's very obvious 
to a, um, a lay observer that they have come from different hospitals. And our hypothesis was that this sort of thing also happened for ECGs um, being recorded in certain countries. And that sounds a little bit weird because the core equipment is all the same, um, but we've shown by trying to build a, a classifier of the uh, individual training data sets that you can predict the country of origin of an ECG over and above the baseline prevalence of diseases. And in fact, serendipitously, we found out that the way that these kinds of data are labeled differs from country to country simply because of the way that medics are trained. And so to ensure that our ECG models really are generalizable and not specific to an individual country or data set, we've been trying out adversarial feature learning to try to create a multitask classifier that's very good at classifying ECG conditions. Um, so this on this slide here, that would be the main task classifier, but uses a gradient reversal layer to become simultaneously very bad at classifying the origin of the ECG. And the idea is that when we balance these two things out, they're, they're regularized, then the features that we end up with are features that are generalizable. So if you're interested in those areas, I'd be very happy to have an offline chat about them. But today I really wanted to focus on one major clinical problem that I'm currently thinking about. And before I begin in earnest, I wanted to highlight the excellent team that I work with on this problem. Um, and as with all translational research that wants to have a real world clinical impact, the team um, has a very wide range of expertise and I commend them to you and they're on the slide here. I've carelessly missed out the fact that there are also um, a number of third year computer science project students who have been working on this in the last couple of months and have made um, a significant impact as I'll mention later on. The problem that we'll be considering here is to do with the catalog of clinical conditions that we call movement disorders. And these are neurological conditions that, as the name suggests, cause abnormal movements. So the most well-known of these is Parkinson's disease, but I've listed some more on the slide here. And so for ease of explanation, and also so that I stay within the realms of my very limited clinical knowledge, um, we're gonna consider just that one condition, Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's was identified by James Parkinson in 1817 and was initially known as the shaking palsy based on one of the primary signs of the disease, an involuntary shaking or tremor. And in fact, it was originally recognized based on observing just six people, three of whom had seen on the streets, which goes to show that it was a lot easier being a scientist in the Victorian era. And these days it's diagnosed by an expert clinician who is looking for a few key signs and actually whilst to, um, to the, the lay person like me tremor is the most well-known symptom um, it also causes muscular stiffness, imbalance and bradykinesia which is slowness of movement and that's actually the key indicator of Parkinson's. For a more precise estimate of the progression of Parkinson's disease, particularly in research, experts use something called the UPDRS scale. And that's a 50 question assessment of motor and non-motor symptoms, so movement and non-movement symptoms, split into four sections, as you can see on the slide here. And one of the four key sections is this motor examination, and that requires the physical presence of a neurologist to ask the patient to do something and that for them to, to watch and see how they are well that they are performing that task. So the kind of things that they ask the patient to do are things like tapping their fingers together or asking the patient to rest their hand to see the amount of tremor. And of course, um, that process can be pretty good. Neurology experts are indeed very good at knowing what looks like Parkinson's. 
However, there are significant drawbacks of this process. And first is that in real clinical practice, any initial diagnosis, or maybe not diagnosis, but triage, is often made in general practice rather than neurology specialists. And in many cases, GPs don't have the same level of specific expertise in the area. And we potentially risk too many people being referred to a specialist or the opposite, even worse, being falsely reassured. And of course, that's not to have a pop at GPs. And actually, even trained neurologists have a very high degree of interrater reliability when they are asked to judge individual signs of movement disorders. So, for instance, in some work that we've got under review, we've discovered that among 20 or so neurologist consultants, they were very inconsistent in estimating the severity of one key sign of Parkinson's disease. And third, and perhaps the most importantly at, at this time of our lives, is that this process, this visual process, needs to be done face to face. And of course, that's been an issue during COVID, where we've sought to reduce the spread of a virus through remote consultations. But regardless of COVID, it's a big problem anyway. So is there any need to bring patients who tend to be frail and by definition have movement disorders to a clinic? Um, is, it, is that really the best um, course, of, course of action for a patient? We want to um, address this problem in the long term by developing methods that allow, um, so there's somebody who's unmuted if you could mute yourself that would be great um, we want to address this problem in the long term by developing methods that allow clinicians to measure the key things that they need to but remotely we believe that video is a suitable medium for achieving this and the key advantage of video is that it's almost ubiquitous most people have a smartphone and unlike other sensors Video measurements wouldn't need any other piece of equipment. It's also truly contactless and remote. And more than that, we think it's particularly suitable for this application as we're mimicking the human visual assessment process. In capturing video, we've got that same core information available. So specifically, we hope that video measurement can provide objective measures for movement disorder symptoms which could replace these subjective measures that are currently being done by neurologists to allow remote monitoring of movement disorder progression and to deal with a fundamental drawback of video consultations as they're used at the moment in that there's a limit to what can currently be achieved over Zoom. And so by addressing this issue, we hope to improve those consultations so that they can be used in um, appropriate cases to limit the amount of travel for patients. So in the longer term, as well as providing these objective biomarkers, we hope that we'll have sufficient data and quality of data to build predictive machine learning models that can help to triage, diagnose and monitor patients with movement disorders. And of course, that's a big ask and some way away yet, but at least this first stage extracting objective, clinically meaningful measurements is something that we've been making progress on. And it might sound a little bit um, far-fetched out of the realms of science fiction, but it's worth bearing in mind that over the last 10 years or so, we've seen advances in computer vision that have allowed us to obtain some fairly unlikely measurements. Um, so we are proposing quantifying things that we can see, that neurologists can see. However, we know that it's already possible to extract measurements of heart rate, breathing rate, and to some degree, oxygen saturation and blood pressure, just from standard video camera data based on the um, color of your skin. So this is work from um, almost 10 years ago now, showing how heart rate can be picked up from a video camera. And our progress so far has been to develop methods for measuring two key symptoms of Parkinson's, bradykinesia and tremor. So starting with bradycardia, then, I've mentioned it's to do with slowness of movement, but more formally, it involves looking at decrements in repetitive movements. So in clinical practice, 
it's measured by using a finger tapping test. And so for the test, patients are asked to tap their thumb and forefinger as quick and as big as possible over 10 seconds. So we do this. And the expert rater looks for changes in speed, amplitude and rhythm. And in the UPDRS scale, that's given a score between zero and four, where zero is normal and four is so severe that the patient can't or can only barely perform the task. And obviously that is um, very subjective. And then there's a more refined score called the modified bradykinesia rating scale, which is specific to bradykinesia. And that just splits up the scoring into these three components for speed, amplitude and rhythm and gives them each a score between zero and four. And we've tried a couple of approaches to objectively assess these components, rhythm, amplitude and speed. Um, one approach I'll ignore here, but there's a link to the paper. Um, and the second approach, which I will talk about, used um, over 100 videos from um, 80 participants. And our goal was to try and generate features or metrics that related to these three components. Just going to pause um, that video so that my laptop doesn't freeze up. But our method relied on using a deep neural network to identify key points on the hand. And that was an architecture developed elsewhere called Deep Lab Cut. And it requires a human user to manually seed those interesting points and then it tracks those points over time. So here's a second example of um, a patient who does have a more severe bradykinesia. Um, and I know that videos are a bit flaky over Zoom, but hopefully you can see um, how those salient points are being tracked over time. So by using this motion tracking neural network, we generated thumb finger distance plots for each video. And that's what you can see on the top left. Um, the raw signal is in the top, a lightly filtered um, version is in the middle. And at the bottom is um, the Fourier transformed version. So converting this um, somewhat repetitive signal into the frequency domain. We then selected some metrics from the signal that we thought should correlate with these um, components of a finger tapping test. And those were entirely heuristic. There's no guarantee at all that they're the best metric. They were very quick and dirty clinical analysis. So to get to the, an idea of the speed, we thought, well, that's a measure of distance over time. So let's calculate the slope of the signal at every point. Um, so that's just differentiating the distance. Um, and similarly for something like um, the amplitude, we just looked at the peak to peak size of a signal and for the rhythm regularity or how, um, how much power is in a small portion of our frequency spectrum. We plotted these simple metrics against the clinical rating and found reasonable agreement with them. And so it's, it's not perfect agreement and it's pretty difficult to tell why because that could be because our metrics aren't optimal, but it could also be due to the known variability in clinical judgment. And of course, we can combine these metrics in a classifier to try and predict the presence or absence of bradykinesia. And when we did so, we found we could get reasonable results, um, but we simply didn't have enough data, particularly of patients with very severe bradykinesia, to find to um, come up with a model that was clean, clinically relevant. And of course, rather than trying to manually extract features in the kind of classical machine learning way, it could be possible to apply a, a multitask deep learning approach where you just throw in the videos and get to your deep neural network to, to do its stuff. And we've explored this, but uh, our preliminary analysis suggests there's a good deal of overfitting and it's something we ought to revisit as we collect more data. Um, I'll skip over the slide, but we've also done a little bit of time series clustering, looking at the same data. And the second movement disorder symptom that we've been tackling is tremor. So tremor is the oscillatory movement caused um, by involuntary rhythmic muscle contraction. And it's common not only for Parkinson's patients, but also a sign of many other diseases, including multiple sclerosis, 
and a condition called essential tremor can also occur for those who've suffered with stroke and it's a common side effect for some drugs to the extent that um, it's estimated that 15% of the population over 50 have a condition that causes tremor. So much like bradykinesia, the diagnosis hinges on a clinician making a visual judgment of the tremor. They look at it and then they try to recognize characteristic, characteristic patterns in frequency and amplitude. Those are the two markers that they look for. But again, like bradykinesia, it's very difficult to recognize subtle differences in movement. And that's no surprise. We're just not very, as humans, we're not very good at assessing different frequencies. And experts often get the diagnosis wrong, particularly early in disease. So we've been developing a way to extract tremor frequency directly from postural and rest tremor assessments. So postural tremor is when you have your hand up in front of you and your hand shakes. And rest tremor is when you have your hand on a chair arm and it shakes a bit like this. Our data was um, from very few patients actually, from 16 patients um, and 40 or so videos. But one of the um, real, real advantages of trying to measure something objective is that it's easy to tell if we're right or wrong. So I'll show you some of those videos and results in a moment, but I'll just describe the signal processing very briefly first. So the first thing we did is we identified the hand um, and the direction of the wrist to fingertip. So that's the long axis. And we can do that automatically using an object detection neural network um, or else by looking at adjacent frames in a video and looking at the movement between two frames. Having extracted that region of interest, we then further process a video by calculating the optic flow. So the optic flow is the distribution of the apparent velocities of objects in an image. So the idea is that frame to frame is showing you the movement between frames. And then to simplify our analysis, we simply summed the optic flow in the short axis direction, that is the direction we believe a priori that the tremor will be in. And the output of this, again, is a 1D signal over time. And we can treat this like any other 1D signal. So to estimate a frequency, we can again convert to the frequency domain and we've used a Fourier transform. And finally, we identify the, the dominant peak. Um, and as you can see um, here, we've applied it to our videos. Um, and you can see the, the difference between the, an accelerometer, a medical grade accelerometer, and our computer vision method. Of course, um, tremor alone is insufficient for clinical use. We need measurements of both frequency and amplitude. However, estimating anything of size from a video is, is kind of a classic challenge in computer vision, which is elegantly summed up by Father Ted what is small and what's far away. And we're just starting some work on this. And so I'll wrap up in the next few minutes um, in trying to measure tremor size. And for this, we really need to measure um, object depth. So distance to an object. And we're looking at three approaches at the moment. Um, one is using binocular vision. So moving a camera and trying to work out the depth and therefore the size of an object. The second of these is um, using a neural network to estimate depth. And we're thinking of using a pre-trained unit called dense depth. There's a link to the paper here, but I mean, it only really works because there's some pre-training data that has the knowledge of certain size of objects. So it, the reality is it probably won't work in our case. And the final approach, which a couple of third year undergraduates, um, James Bungay and Osa, have just started to test out is to use the built-in depth sensor. And the video on the slide here is from data that um, one has captured in the last couple of weeks, showing how we can get a 3D point cloud in real time using the front facing camera on an iPhone. And so as, as you can hopefully see that depth sensor manages to differentiate between the arm and the background, and you can even see the, 
depth detail on individual fingers. And that depth sensor is accurate mainly because it's used for facial recognition for screen unlocking. It's not necessarily practical because it's only on the front facing camera for most, um, for most iPhones. Um, but the main advantage is we can get a direct 3D estimate of, of points, which may be accurate enough for us to measure tremor in 3D directly. And in any case, we'll be testing these methods um, for robustness over the next few months. So to tie it up then, our, our, our basic plan over the next year, hopefully um, to receive funding in the next week, we'll see, is to test these results, um, but also to start to bring them into clinical practice. And we're working with a company to, um, to build these into a working mobile application that we hope will be used um, useful for research as a, as a biomarker measurement tool, but also potentially in neurology clinics to help assessment of these conditions. Cool, I shall end there, thanks. Thanks, David. Um, great. Um, we start a bit late, so I'm going to go over time a little bit so that people have a chance to ask David some questions. Uh, so go ahead and uh, put any questions in the chat. Um, so while people are thinking, I'll, uh, I've got a question. Um, so you mentioned, um, you know, iPhone has some depth sensor um, if you're actually getting into making medical devices, is it possible to use sort of, um, you know, standard commercial off the shelf technology for that? Or do things have to be developed in a more kind of controlled way? Um, can, you know, could you use an iPhone? Uh, yeah, as in like, will that pass regulations? Yeah, so that's what I mean, yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good question. I think the answer really is, does it pass the clinical evaluation? So we know that there's going to be some sort of tolerance on that depth because there'll be manufacturing issues. And then the question really then is, despite that tolerance, are we able to robustly measure amplitude? And I think it really comes down to, um, so if we can measure depth as a, if we're to, you know, 99% accuracy, then as you get further away, you get a better estimate of depth. Mm -hmm. And if your camera is high enough resolution, then it may be that your tolerances overall are sufficient. Um, the kind of reality of clinical practice at the moment is that they eyeball it and say, well, is this tremor about one centimeter? So right. it's, a, it's a fairly low bar in that respect. Right, okay. Um, Marcel's asking, uh, many of your problems relate to quality of labeling. Um, do you, do you kind of measure the quality of the label? Yeah, yeah. you, you mentioned it at some point, but I was wondering if you really assess it. Yeah. So for, for Bredikonesia, um, it's challenging to measure the quality of labeling because it is purely subjective for something if like- We have multiple people doing it, for instance. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. So we have had multiple people doing it so we can measure the the distribution of that and and have a mean so we could do um so we can take that into account yeah, the, what we've done what, to what we often do is uh, is that we have multiple observers and then use like an analysis of variance method to mm -hmm. uh to try and distinguish between the, the uncertainty of the computer algorithm and of the observers yep which you can do if you have enough measurements yeah yeah and i guess kind of mixed mixed level models would do the same sort of thing right mm -hmm. um what we've done to steer clear of that, particularly for NIHR purposes, is by focusing on tremor, you have objective measurements, um, and that avo avoids having to, to explain and to deal with those issues. Yeah. You mentioned adversarial training to remove um, this kind of batch effect of medical training yeah. across countries at the beginning. Um, so, uh, is that something that, um, like, did it work completely? I mean, we've, we've also used adversarial training to remove batch effects in some data, but we've not always found it's the best approach. Did, was it a good approach in your case? Yeah, so it did improve things. Um, we, we didn't manage to submit it 
for the hidden test data. So the, the you know the proof of the, whether it really works is is still out there. And um, the work that it was inspired by, obviously, it was um, stuff from a um, from Andrew Dizerman and and those guys. But there's folks from the IBM in Oxford, um, so Nicola Dinsdale, um, who has shown that has been successful for them for um, image segmentation tasks, so for MRI brain images. Right. Okay. Um, so any other questions for David before we close? Can I ask another question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, go for it. Yeah. The what, what I'm kind of surprised about is that when you're looking at the finger tapping, is that you actually don't split the signal up according to taps, uh, which would allow you to do a much simpler analysis, like uh, like just tap by tap amplitude and tap by tap frequency. I was just wondering why that was. Yeah, um, so, so Marcel, well, you, we asked this last time, actually. Oh, yeah, but it's automatic. Um, yeah, I can't remember that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think, um, so I think in, th in this... Case. I mean, it depends on the on the use case, right? So for um, for tremor um, specifically, then the tremor the way that is measured is a ten seconds test, and they um, they take the the average frequency at the end. So we're we're replicating that clinical process basically. Got that. And by the way, your iPhone, oh, there is another question, but your iPhone, uh, a problem could be that the next generation iPhone won't have that sensor, but will have something else. Yeah, so actually the newest iPhones do have the sensors on the back, um, okay. but my, but neither myself nor my third year students are rich enough to have the latest model. <laughs> no, the, the problem is in the future, in the future it will go away. So you've got your validated technique on an iPhone that's no longer available. Oh yes, that is also <laughs> something that we're, yeah I'm aware well, of. <laughs> yeah. Even even the current generation iPhones have cheap and expensive models with different levels yeah. of camera sophistication, right? Yeah. So Ravi's asking, uh, how long do you think this would be adopted in real world clinical settings? <laughs> how, how you know or ever? You know? Yeah, I mean it's 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 a real challenge, and so I think one of the core things with any kind of medical technology is finding. Um, making sure that it fits into an existing clinical process, because as soon as you try to change that, then, uh, you know, clinicians are super busy. So anything that involves changing, changing their process causes more chaos, often causes more chaos than it's worth. But to kind of give you an idea, we've previously developed software for early warning scores where nurses enter their vital signs. So exactly the same that they would do on paper and follows pretty much exactly the process that they would, they would do pre, uh, you know, on paper as electronically and from end to end to get stuff into a hospital, ignoring any regulation took about two, two and a half years. Um, but I think that's quite unusual though. That's very unusual. <laughs> I think the sort of uptake, you know, the, the fact that, um, primary care consultations are often by video now. And does that give us opportunities to do more things uh, using kind of image data? Cause I guess, or is, the, is yeah. it just impossible to implement? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think if the infrastructure is there, then it potentially does. I think the challenge will be to make it work in an unobtrusive way. So you don't want to have a doctor to say, oh, I'm just gonna change programs now and get my computer vision bits out yeah um yeah great okay uh thanks david and thanks marceau uh two great talks um i think we'd better wrap up there because we've gone way over time but um thanks and uh i think we've got we're starting again um uh in the new year with more uh cheering fellows talks so i'm looking forward to that and um have a great uh, Christmas and New Year, everyone. I think this is our last one. So thank you. And thanks to speakers.